Happy Sunshine family. Lunacy is back for part five of the conversation on the record that Heather is having with C. Clifford Shirley Jr. in the Eastern District of Tennessee Courthouse in Knoxville, Tennessee on October 18th, 2017. We left off at the end of page 69 going into page 60. Transition over to this window. We should be able to see my pointer. All right. <clears throat> We're good to go. The judge says to you, let's see, what are those documents? 48 and I think 49 and 53. Do you recognize that? You came and filed those the other day. If you look up here. <clears throat> Heather says, I've got 48, document 48. Judge continues, and you just said that the indictment is duly canceled and void. Is that right? Okay, replies Heather. I have document 50, which was, that was your, judge cuts her off. I'm asking you about document 48, the indictment in this case. Yes, says Heather. I have document 48 and document 58 in front of me. Okay, says Judge Shirley. And you just marked across them the indictment, void and duly canceled. Yes, I did. Or excuse me. Yes, I took a certified copy out from the clerks because they have the original. So I took it out. They would not give me a redacted or excuse me, the unredacted, meaning the indictment that has the name of the four person on there. And let me... Let's see here. One of these. Well, I thought I had that document up in a window, but I don't. So we'll have to cover it on a different time. She just kind of wrote over it in her handwriting and, and put duly canceled. And is it your position that because you marked on that and put your fingerprint on it, that that makes the indictment void? Yes, says Heather. It's my understanding from charging. My history of charging, charging documents, as well as in the highest levels of bank trade and finance, where we receive the actual documentations for monetization. For the monetization, which this is the only way. Only the true issuer can actually cancel something, same as if I write a check. I'm the only one that can actually cancel it. So when I was taken on the 25th, judge cuts her off, who's the original issuer of the indictment? Heather says, I am the original issuer of the indictment. Wow, this is, that's a non-standard reply right there. Heather claims that she is the original issuer of the indictment. <clears throat> Judge says, you issued this indictment against yourself? Heather's explanation here. This indictment through collusion at the highest levels that actually give you all the rules that you think you're following or that you have followed, excuse me, that you think are lawful, that is actually how charging documents work, and they are monetized. These are prepared for monetization, so only with the fingerprints and the signature of the actual person that is being indicted, they are the original issuer of that indictment. So nobody goes to jail, nobody gets charged with a crime except by their own consent. This is a voiding of any consent, whether presumed or actual. It's what we call manufactured consent because informed, knowing, willing, and intentional. That is consent. Okay, says the judge. However, continues Heather, the way this document and the way that they conducted themselves is not consent. It's manufactured consent by presumption and threat of force, threat of use of force. So this is just canceling the indictment, which I'm the only one that issued it against myself. So that's why I'm saying, if they want to bring forward a foreman, or if she wants to, 
Cynthia Davidson wants to show me her authority and authorization and identification to be able to actually issue a charge against me. That's what I'm asking for. I still haven't received it. As of this moment, this record is void of any of those documentations, which were required in order to rebut the declaration that you don't have jurisdiction. Nobody has jurisdiction or authority over me. That's a pretty fine point right there, and I can't highlight it very easily. Nobody has jurisdiction or authority over me. Judge says, okay, you also filed a price to pay, document 54, just recently, which appears to be an order for dismissal signed, signed by you. Is that correct? Heather says, I provided the blank one to everybody that's in this room or parties to this particular case. And then behind that, I did sign one. It would be page six is the one I signed. However, the blank one, so it's proposed. I signed for my part because I'm the only one that can give authorization. Judge says, so if the style of the case is the alleged United States District Court and the order for dismissal with prejudice is signed by Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe, your proposal is that you have authority to issue orders in this court. Heather says, well, if you actually read this, it's giving you leave to actually file this, to actually... Judge says, I understand filing it, but I'm asking you the authority to sign an order you believe rests in you. Actually, continues Heather, the authority is stated in here, and this is, still, I have not received anything as far as your jurisdiction. If there's no jurisdiction established and the burden is on you, and it is on Anne-Marie Svalto and Cynthia Davidson. I do not. There is no authority whatsoever here. So therefore, it's the case is dismissed. Judge says, did you have authority to sign that order? I did, says Heather. And did, Heather cuts him off, and it actually has to be signed by you in order to go forward. Why, asks the judge. It just says I'm doing all this granting you leave to file it. Well starts Heather, not to enter it, interrupts the judge. Exactly, continues Heather, because I don't have anything from you, any sworn, verified, and validated proof, documentation that you actually have authority over me, and I'm not consenting to you having authority over me. I'm here so that we could resolve this in a very amicable manner. Judge says, all I'm trying to do is ask you questions. If I could get an answer, it would be so much simpler. Right now, starts Heather, I'm the only one, myself, and I've seen declarations or the documentation provided by Mr. Bean. Right now, we're the only two in this courtroom. He has authority only over himself. I have authority over myself. Randy speaks up. If I may ask a question. Yes, says the judge. Randy continues. You referenced on August 29th, in reference back on August 29th, you specifically asked me if I thought I was God in the courtroom. Right, says Judge Shirley, because you said you were the source of all that is. Randy continues, my question to you is, what gives you authority over me in this situation if you are not God? What a great question. Get right up in there, Randy. Get your piece. Good, good job. Judge says, is it your position that a judge does not have authority over you <clears throat> when you are alleged to have committed a crime? Randy says, we've asked for that proof of who you are. Judge says, okay, that's what we're asking for. All right, says the judge. And so if I showed you my appointment as a United States magistrate judge, would that suffice for you? Randy says it would be for my review and also Miss Tucci Giraffes. 
Well, replies the judge, would that suffice? Because that's what I have. Well, we would review it, and then our answer would be, judge cuts him off, would that suffice for you? Heather speaks up. Well, I would also need the judge cuts her off. If I saw your diploma, Heather continues, only it will only be one part of the documentation that's required amongst the rest. I would need proof. Judge cuts her off. What's the rest? Heather continues, I would need proof that the United States actually exists and is lawful and validated. The only one that can actually do that is, judge says, I can't prove that, can I? Because they don't under your theory as of March 13th, 2013, they don't exist. So how could I prove that? If you, continues Heather, are you claiming that you work for the United States? Ooh, bam. Yes, I work for the United States courts. What an admission. The judge is claiming that he works for the United States courts. You know, all of this back and forth tug of war verbal fencing match that's going on here. This is a gold mine right here. Judge C. Clifford Shirley admits he works for the United States, that he is in the employ of the United States courts. <clears throat> Very important. Page 66, line 1. Interesting page to find that on, huh? It may be his undoing. Maybe the court's undoing. Which feels like it's in the highest and best purposes of all of us involved. So Heather continues, okay. <clears throat> wouldn't the United States courts, the United States itself, wouldn't that documentation be available to you? What a question. I mean, it's the same as working for an employer. Wow, very true. They wouldn't have, or excuse me, wouldn't they have their articles of incorporation? Wouldn't they have their broad resolution giving you authority? That's the stuff I'm looking for. Judge says, I do, and I've told you, it's in the United States Constitution, which gives the Congress the authority to set up the courts. I gave you the statute in which Congress took that authority and set up the courts. It specifically sets up this court and it allows for judges like myself. And so that's our authority. And you know what, what C. Clifford Shirley feels like here is he's panicking. He's saying United States Constitution gives me my authority. But Heather has already, already foreclosed on that. The Constitution's a contract. It's pretty much null and void. It doesn't exist now. And so she's got proof of that. And the judge, even though he's seen proof of that, keeps saying, the Constitution, that's my authority. And so the judge is basically refusing. This is willful ignorance. Ignorance, the root of that word is ignore. When you willfully ignore your own senses, the own verified, validated proof that Heather has brought into the courts that the United States corporations and all of its subsidiaries, including the courts, do not exist, then what we've got is a situation where an unlawful lien has been placed on Heather's voice. Because ignorance shuts down voice. And that's where, that's where my comments were coming from yesterday. As far as lean voce and the roots of violence uh, coming when people's voices are shut down. We are designed to live in a society that allows for us to explore ourselves, come to a place of knowing about ourselves, and communicate who we are to others. And we live in anything but a society that does that. We live in a, a society that judges us. Judgment. Judgment is the antithesis of love. Love is to live a one vibrational experience. Judgment is to make the decisions in your life based on a set of prescribed lists. If this happens, then I do this. 
If somebody comes into my courtroom, I have authority. And judgment, judgment has a limited shelf life. And the ascension is all about love, overtaking judgment as the metric for living a healthy life. Okay, says Heather. So then all you would need is a declaration from, court says, I don't need to give you a declaration. That's the law. No, says Heather. What I'm saying is, is from Jeff Sessions, who is the one that actually set up these courts and the, dis, or the Department of Justice. Everyone's underneath him, correct? He would just have to validate and verify your appointment. Judge Shirley says, he doesn't set up this court. He doesn't give me my authority. Okay, says Heather, whoever gives you your authority, that's who we would need. And then we would need identification of that and their authority. Okay, says the judge. Heather continues, it's just a, it's called an evidentiary paper trail, which I know you're very familiar with as well as they are. We're just saying... What's your identification and your authority and your authorization? Whoever gave you the authorization, the, th the same things are required. What is their identification? What's their authority? That's what is needed, a paper trail all the way back to the beginning. Otherwise, there is no authorization. You would actually, at that point, everything that has been stated here today without that is just proof of, one, collusion, or incompetency. And I don't believe that you're... This says, and I don't believe you're an competent gentleman at all. So Rebecca Lockwood, the court reporters, made a, a mistake here. I don't believe you're incompetent at all, I believe is what Heather is saying here. I don't believe you're incompetent gentlemen at all. I don't believe Anne-Marie Svalto and Cynthia Davidson are incompetent. I just believe that there has been a lot withheld as far as information and data, and it is all fraudulent. That's what was shut down, was just the fraud that was being committed by the banking parts of the system, which I was completely involved with. So as far as coming in here, this is out of courtesy because there is none of that documentation that I requested and you stated you didn't have and you've indicated that you will not give it to me, period. Anne-Marie Svalto and Cynthia Davidson as well as Parker Still and everyone else that's been named in there have remained silent. Wow. Lines one through three on page 68. Anne-Marie Svalto, Cynthia Davidson, as well as Parker Still, and everyone else <clears throat> that's been named in there have remained silent. Judge says, let me just be sure, because now, after today's hearing, <clears throat> you may be treading on questionable ground. Do you recognize my authority to issue the release order that I released you on or not? So... He's, he's going back to detention hearing issues and, and start pulling those things out, which really don't have anything to do with this. Heather says, for me, that was a private agreement between you and I. No, ma'am, says the judge. That was a court order issued by me as the magistrate judge. You either accept that authority or you do not. And if you do not, Heather cuts him off. I accept it. Judge says, why would I, <clears throat> would I allow you to remain out? Heather says, I accepted your agreement, and I still accept. Judge cuts her off. No, it's not an agreement. It's an order from me with all the authority of the United States behind it. Do you accept that or do you not? It's a yes or a no. You know, he's, <clears throat> he's really throwing a temper tantrum here. He's really opening the door to his ego and he's jumping in with both feet first. I mean, this guy has been sitting on the bench for his whole career. <clears throat> he's been thinking he's been giving orders out and he gets pissed off when people's behavior don't fall right in line with that order. 
if your behavior is against your will but falls in line with his order, that is your silence, your manufactured consent. So Heather is staying true to the course. She is saying she does not consent. Heather continues, I accepted the order that you did without prejudice, which means all the stuff that isn't there isn't there. But I am following this order that you and I entered into. Judge Shirley says, do you understand you have to comply with the conditions in my court order? Heather says, have you received any information otherwise that I have not followed everything that you and I signed off on? Question mark. I didn't ask you about whether you followed them, says the judge. I asked you, did you agree that you must follow them? Heather says, I agreed to see you on that day, and I reconfirm it again this day, that I agree to it. I'm following it. You understand, continues the judge, you have to comply with my court order, or you don't get to stay out, correct? So here, he's just stepping into his ego again. You must comply with my order. <clears throat> I told you then and I told you now, continues Heather, I choose to follow that court order because we're going to finish this all amicably. I said until this was disposed of in an amicable and affinitive way that I would follow that agreement between you and I, or that order was signed off by both of us. You know, this is, the judge is picking a fight here. He's trying to get uh, Heather to uh, to have an outburst. That's what I see going on here. I've seen a lot of cops on the street talk to people this way, hoping that they'll react, and then they get to kick their ass, take them to the hospital, and then take them to jail. This is, this is the pinnacle of gaslight energy right here. And, of course, it's not going to be C. Clifford Shirley Jr. that would deal with any physical altercation, but he's the one that is surely trying to instigate it. And he's doing that by stepping into his ego. I see that, and I'm shining light on that for the rest of the family. Judge says, do you agree that I have the authority to issue that order? <clears throat> Heather says, I agree that I gave you consent to issue that order, yes. All right, give you one last chance. Heather says, without jurisdiction. Judge says, I'll give you one last chance. Do you agree that I have the authority to issue that order? Heather says, you have the authority to issue that order because I gave that authority to issue that order. Okay, says the judge. It is an order, continues Heather. I continue to follow until we have a disposition in this case, a final disposition. All right, says the judge. Do you have anything further to argue with regard to your non-motion? Again, he's throwing the word in argue, and now he's making fun of her non-motion because you've said it's a, it's not a motion. I mean, I'm not being facetious. You specifically made a filing that said your precipe is not a motion, correct? Again, he's fully in his ego here, and he's panicking. Heather says a precipe. Right, says the judge. First off, I'm not arguing anything I have declared. Yeah, that goes right, that got sent right back to him. Good job, Heather. Okay, says the judge. Heather continues, I have made declarations. They have not been rebutted. All right, it's a declaration, not a motion. You're not asking me to do anything. No, says Heather, the precipe is an order, but the basis for those orders being issued were the declaration of due cause. Okay, says the judge, but it's not a motion in which you have moved the court to do anything. Heather says the, ad the addressees on that precipe were ordered to do the precipe one. Okay, says the judge. They'll either do them or they won't. I mean, when you order somebody to do something, they will either do it or they won't. So they'll either do it or they won't. That's correct, says Heather. They will do it or they don't. There was a notice that was put in there. Okay, says the judge. But the basis for doing those was not given to everyone, which is the 
Uh, excuse me, I, I got I got mixed up here. Okay, says the judge. Heather continues, but the basis for doing those or not was given to everyone, which is the judge cuts her off. I got you. Heather continues, declaration of due cause. I got that, says the judge. That is the authority that was, that it's based on, says Heather. I'm just trying to figure out, says the judge, if I have to do anything. Because when people file a motion, I have to file an order responding to that motion. In this case, there is no motion. Heather says, well, I would have filed a motion, but the court, you yourself, Anne-Marie Svalto and Cynthia Davidson have not provided proof of jurisdiction or authority, so therefore I couldn't file any motions. Because you've actually got to have uh, a lawful matter, a lawful hearing that is in front of the courts, and until they provide the proof of their jurisdiction and authority, there is none. There can be no motions because a motion can only be submitted after there's an actual hearing, after there's an actual jurisdiction established is the way I'm reading this. <clears throat> okay, says the judge. Heather continues, and I don't consent. I haven't consented to any authority other than what you and I just clarified. Well, that would be, Heather cuts him off, in that particular order of detention. <clears throat> that would be an incorrect statement, says the judge, because I ordered you to have a deadline for today for filing motions. You chose not to file a motion. You could have filed a motion. No, says Heather. No, says the judge. Everybody does in these cases. The, all the defendants file motions. Well, not all, but most defendants file motions, and then I rule on them. You chose not to. Instead, you chose to file a praesepe, and you say you can't because you haven't gotten this information from us, but that's just the basis for your choice not to file one. Heather says, so is it your position that if you don't have jurisdiction and authority over someone in your courtroom, you can order them to file motions? What a great question. Wow. Kudos to Heather for staying on her firm platform of agency here. No, ma'am, says the judge. I have jurisdiction and authority over you in this case. That's your assertion, asks Heather. Yes, ma'am, says the court. Bam, what an admission right there. Okay, continues Heather. Then why haven't we had documentation? Because I don't. The court says, because I don't send documentation in the hundreds of cases I have. I get that, says Heather. The judge continues, I just don't send out. Heather says, how many do you have? Judge continues, say everybody. Heather says, how many do you have? Can I finish? Because she's not going to get down what you're saying. I apologize. When you talk over me like you're doing now, I apologize. Go ahead, says Heather. Okay, I don't do that. I don't have every defendant come in here and say, quote, now let me show you my authority. Let me show you where I got appointed. Let me show you how this statute that says that. Let me take you back to the Constitution where this court system was set up. Let me show you where the Congress then appointed the court. End quote. I don't do that, okay? It's a waste of time because the fact is, just because you say there is no United States, just because you say it's foreclosed, just because you say it's a corporation, doesn't make it so. You know what? Heather is not just saying this, C. Clifford. Heather has brought you solid, unrebutted documentation that this does exist. And you've squeamed and wiggled and squirmed the whole time that Heather's been in your courtroom. And now you're just saying that you don't do it, you've never done it in any of your past hundreds of cases, and that you don't have to. And all of this is great statements, great spontaneous admissions of your either incompetence, your willful ignorance, and in which case, if you do have willful ignorance, that leads into collusion. Heather's right. So judge continues, it would be as if you were to say that my robe was red, 
Just because you say it doesn't make it so. And if you were to ask me to send you proof that it was black, I wouldn't have to do that. Again, the judge takes a totally unrelated situation here and tries to turn this back on Heather. Actually, what Heather is doing is saying, I can see your robe is red. I have brought in documented proof that your robe is red. And here, you need to give me a rebuttal that your robe is a color other than red because it has to be red in order for us to have these hearings. And it's not. Or excuse me, it has to be black in order to have these hearings. You know, this, this, this is a way to try to take a pattern that, or a dynamic that is true to wrap it into an oversimplified example that is absolutely ludicrous and, and, and then try to equate Heather's position in this court as being ludicrous because of the stupid example that he just gave. He is in full panic mode here. So he continues, it's simply legal nonsense and you've just made it up out of whole cloth. And so if you can show me that I don't have authority, I will be glad to look at that. But until then, no. So Heather says, so are you shifting just for clarification? Are you saying that you have it and that you've shifted it to me when I'm the one he cuts her off? I'm saying I showed you where my authority came from. It comes from the law. It comes from the Constitution of the United States. It comes from the Congressional Acts and the law of the United States. And your response was, quote, those don't exist, end quote. So we're very simple. I say my law emanates. My jurisdiction and authority emanates from the law. And you say the law doesn't exist. And you say that based on a filing in which you claim that the law supports you. So that's where we're going to have a problem. Heather says, you can say it all day long, but as far as I, if it is that way, then I would be very happy to receive in a sworn declaration saying, verifying and validating your lawful authority, that your position that you believe you have, I have not received anything. Once I make a declaration that was just a presumption at best. At most, you had the authority when I was first brought in. And mind you, I didn't come in willingly, knowingly, and intentionally. I was drug in with shackles. No, ma'am, says the judge. But see, that's where you're wrong. You just make up legal stuff. There's no presumption. I agree with you, says Heather. There's no presumption. There's a reality, says the judge. Heather continues, I just declare that there is no jurisdiction. That was done on the 24th. At that point, the burden shifts to the one who declares that or that presumes or proffers that they do have jurisdiction. I haven't received any of that. Yes, you have. In their response, the judge says, it says, Heather cuts him off. The response was duly rejected for cause because the judge says, you just wrote it, quote, duly rejected for cause, end quote. That doesn't mean it's rejected. You can reject it, and you did, and that's fine. You can throw it in the trash. You can put it in the paper shredder. You can do whatever you want with it. I, on the other hand, in this court, accepted it, have read it, and pretty much agree with it because it sets out our authority for the courts. It sets it out. It sets out the jurisdiction. You just, quote, duly rejected it. She set it out. So you asked me. You asked me to give you stuff, and what you will do is duly reject it. I don't know, starts Heather, which means nothing, interrupts the judge. I don't know what you're going to hand me, says Heather. It's legal mumbo-jumbo, says the judge. It is not. The judge says, it doesn't exist in law, and you know that because you're a lawyer. That there is no way a criminal defendant charged with a criminal... With a criminal def probably offense, with a criminal defense in this court or any other courts can walk in and write, quote, duly rejected, end quote, end quote, void, end quote, on that indictment and walk away from their crime. But Heather cuts him off. Actually, I do 100% know that's how it actually functions as far as the, the things that you sent up to the Federal Reserve, the clerks. The judge says, I send nothing to the Federal Reserve. 
You don't, but the court clerk does. No, she doesn't, says the judge. Heather cuts him off. The clerk of court. The clerk of court sends it out, and J.P. Morgan actually monetizes it. What I'm telling you is, you can present me anything you want all day long. But I'm saying, says the judge, Heather cuts him off. I will review it. I will either accept it or reject it. That's how it actually works. I do not have proof of her identity. That's why it was rejected without dishonor. She can re-present it if she just gives me I don't have anything with her authorization from Nancy Stollard. Nancy Stollard supposedly hasn't even been reconfirmed by the Senate yet. I mean, there's a lot of issues here. If you want to present me with that documentation, but there was nothing, you brought me in. I told you I do not consent to having to you having authority over me. I've given you documentation, even before I arrived, of my sole authority, my ownership, and my status, my legal status. And everyone went in. If there was no presumption, great. Then my lack of jurisdiction is completely with honor, and it is completely the only thing that exists here right now. I do not have anything from you other than some words. So if you want to put those words down on a piece of paper and sign it with your responsibility or in your position, whatever you want to do, just I will take that. Hers was rejected because she, Anne Marie Sfalto, because she sent me something. It didn't have her identification. It didn't have her authorization from Nancy Stollard. It didn't have Nancy Stollard's authorization from whoever appointed her. And like I said, even supposedly, Senate has not even reconfirmed her yet. Judge says, here's here's where we have the biggest problem. Two things. Number one, so many of the facts you alleged are utter falsehoods. They're completely not true. That's number one. Which ones? I'm sorry, says Heather. When you said I reported to the federal bank, Heather says, I didn't say you. All the documents from the clerk of court. Yeah. Where do you think that goes, continues Heather. They don't go to any bank, replies the judge. This is, that's an interesting statement, a spontaneous statement to get on the record from the judge there. Heather Heather asks, who do they go to? Judge says, I know where they go. Uh, I wonder if he really does. Heather continues, okay, they will go to whoever you send them to. And from there, it's sent to another. And from there, it's sent to another. But I can tell you, they end up at the Federal Reserve. And J.P. Morgan Bank is actually the ones who usually, we call them prison bonds, is the street term, but they are securities. Okay, says Judge Shirley. Number two, I think I'm now getting where our real disconnect is. You want all of us to submit all this authorization, validation, everything, because you think that you have to consent to being prosecuted. And unless we show you our authority, validation, justification, identification, you aren't in a position to consent. The point is, you don't get to consent. Under what authority, asks Heather? Judge says, most criminal defendants are in here against their consent. They don't want to be prosecuted, and they don't want to go to prison. Well, that's where the disconnect has been in the legal system, starts Heather. Right, says the judge. Heather continues, is that there is no consent. And when, <clears throat> and people, when they do say that they cancel any consent that's manufactured, the judge cuts her off. That's my point, that your argument, Heather continues, we're sending people to jail that haven't consented. Can I finish, asks the judge. Your argument would mean for everyone out there, I can go rob a bank. I can go assault anybody. I can break in Ms. Giraffe's house, take all your belongings, and then simply say to the police, quote, you don't have any authority. You can't take me to court because I don't consent. And Miss Prosecutor, you can't prosecute me. And Mr. Judge, you can't sentence me because I don't consent. I'm going to go back out and do more of it because I don't consent. And if you file anything, I will write, quote, duly rejected, and then you have to let me go. Heather says, no, that is not what I'm saying. That is exactly what you're saying, says the judge. No, says Heather, that is not what I'm saying. 
It's similar to Mr. Parker still, I understand, where the call came down to have me arrested. I understand where that came from. I know where that came from, okay? I haven't committed any crimes. If anything, I have a 20-year history of stopping crimes from being committed. However, I understand why he was asked to do this. I understand completely. I have not committed any crimes, and as far as the judge cuts her off, this has nothing to do with what I said. Yes, it does, says Heather. No, says the judge. Heather says, because there's an abuse, you have, same thing in the 1920s, you have the same thing going on where you have unconscionable, illegal acts being committed by those who have been charged with the duty to uphold laws. And these laws were actually regulations of commerce. You have things that were regulated, put into regulations, and people are actually in jails, whether you want to admit it or not, or whether you know it or not, by their consent. But it is a manufactured consent. I am saying everyone, we do our jobs correctly. We do our jobs right. The only thing that was closed down was the fraud of the corporations operating under the guise of government. I have been in this country. I have worked just not for this country, but for every single human being on this planet only for the last 20 years. That has been what I breathed and lived, so there is no more fraud being committed and there is no more injustice. I'm saying let's do our jobs properly. Let's do the ones we think we're doing. So that is what is happening right now, is the disclosure, the actual public awareness that the corporation that was operating under the guise of government wasn't, wasn't the United States that you thought you were working for. That's all that was. Judge cuts her off. I understand, but your whole price of pay and all your filings say you and your case should be dismissed, not because you're innocent, not because you didn't do anything wrong, but because nobody has authority to prosecute you. No, says Heather. It's because you're sitting on a corporate bench that actually judge interrupts her. Because I'm sitting on a corporate bench, I have no authority to prosecute you or to, I mean, to sit in judgment of you. Heather says, this is where we had the disconnect that is being resolved right now because of this case, which is why I'm committed to having an amicable disposition of this case so that we can, judge cuts her off. I mean, that's your point though, right? That's your point. Heather says, my point is that your authority, your jurisdiction, they don't exist under the, under laws and applications that you didn't even know existed. Okay, says the judge. Heather continues, I'm saying that I gave you the authority to be able to issue that order, and I'm going to follow that until we have an amicable disposition in this case. Okay, says the judge. Heather says, I'm not here to harm anyone. I've never harmed anyone, so judge cuts her off. Well, the disconnect is you want an amicable disposition. I'm pretty sure you would not agree to being found guilty and being either fined or sentenced to time. Heather says, I don't consent to doing any of that, and it never was designed. This case was not designed, and those involved made sure it would not go there. It would not go to that disposition. All right, Ms. Falto, what's the government response? Before I read Ms. Falto's statements, I'm just going to reread what Heather says here. I don't consent to doing any of that, and it never, excuse me, it never was designed. This case was not designed, and those involved made sure it would not go there. It would not go to that disposition. Interesting, she's talking about this case being designed. I wonder what she means by that. It sounds like her entire appearance in court may have been part of a grander plan that was designed, and she's talking about all the people involved were making sure that it wasn't going to go to her being fined or sentenced to time. That, this, is, this is very interesting. Page 82, lines 19 through 22. I don't consent to doing any of that, and it never was designed. This case was not designed, and those involved made sure it would not go there. It would not go to that disposition, the disposition of being found guilty and being either fined or sentenced to time is what she's referring to. 
uh, something's going on here. There's, there's much more going on. Heather is much more prepared possibly than any of us have previously had a notion of. Where are we at right now? 45 minutes? All right, well, normally I would cut it off right here, but I know that Terry Luster is sitting on the edge of the seat and intently waiting for more. So for Terry, we're going to do page 83. Much love, Terry. So Anne Marie says, we'll rely primarily on our written response, which we went through. You can check out the video of that. But I'm not sure there's anything I can tell your honor or Miss Tucci Giraffe or Mr. Bean that will change anyone's minds here. The court has to find that it has personal jurisdiction over the defendants and subject matter jurisdiction over the defendants. So she's, she's saying, hey, the court has to do this. This is the outcome that the court has to come to. And without question, or it unquestionably has both, she says. USC 18, section 3231 that your honor referenced earlier gives this court subject matter jurisdiction over matters involving crimes against the United States. It is not in dispute that the defendants were charged by a grand jury for crimes against the United States. So the court, therefore, under the valid United States Code, has subject matter jurisdiction over the criminal case, and the court has personal jurisdiction over each of the defendants because they have been charged with a criminal offense. The fact that they were brought here forcibly and without consent does not deprive the court of personal jurisdiction. As Your Honor has noted, criminal defendants do not have to agree to be prosecuted, and this court does not have to find that they consent to being prosecuted in order to have personal jurisdiction over defendants. So the court certainly has personal jurisdiction over Mr. Bean and Miss Tucci Giraffe. With respect to the UCC filings, those have no legal consequence. It appears that the, you know, the defendants are arguing that there was some sort of default judgment issued against the United States that put the United States in foreclosure or that put the United States in some sort of default. And then they filed the UCC statement saying that. The UCC statement itself has no legal relevance over the jurisdiction of this case. It doesn't appear to be based on an actual judgment anywhere. The fact that it states a declaration of judgment doesn't make it a declaration of judgment. It doesn't mean that there was a default judgment. Whether notice of foreclosure was ever sent to the United States Secretary of State or anyone else does not make the UCC filing statement a valid and forcible judgment in any way. <clears throat> and because the UCC statement is merely... A typical UCC filing statement is merely used to perfect a security lien. The security interest and the lien would have to be based on a valid judgment, and no valid judgment against the United States exists here. So the UCC filing statements are of no consequence to the finding of jurisdiction. With respect to the court and the United States having to prove their authority, the court is under no obligation to do so, neither is the United States. If the court has any obligation with respect to the defendant's arguments in that matter, it is to tell them that they're wrong. So there is no obligation to prove that your honor is an authorized judge. The jurisdiction lies in the statutes we've presented, and that is all that is of consequence here. The Sixth Circuit, the Seventh Circuit have all addressed this. These types of arguments where the court does not have jurisdiction over someone who's essentially claiming to be a sovereign citizen are meritless and that there is no need to consent to jurisdiction, but that the court must find personal subject matter jurisdiction. Interesting here that Anne-Marie Svalto is using the uh, oxymoron of sovereign citizen. You cannot be a citizen and be sovereign. And as uh, I believe Heather points out later, uh, sovereign means that you have to be ruling over somebody. Both of these exist here, and that's the position of the United States. So if there are no questions, I'll... The judge says, so are you familiar with the United States v. Pryor? Yes, says Anne-Marie Svalto. 
Judge continues, and did the Sixth Circuit hold that courts, much like this one, including this one, have both subject matter and in persona jurisdiction and criminal prosecutions? Yes, says Anne Marie Svalto. Judge says, did the Supreme Court deny cert in that? Yes, there was. That cert was denied last year. The case came out in 2015 or 2016. And is that your understanding that it's my duty to follow the law of the Sixth Circuit? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. This is a dog and pony show here. Uh, this is, you know what? Two people are going to get together that, uh, that are going to agree on something, and they're going to have this quick back and forth conversation that give C. Clifford Shirley his quote unquote authorization and jurisdiction. But everything that Anne-Marie and Judge Shirley cited is a product of the United States Corporation, which is no more. So there's a whole train, a whole long line of techniques and attempts by C. Clifford Shirley and the rest of the members of this court to somehow gaslight Heather and Randy and the rest of us out here that none of what they're saying has any merit. And that's just not true because when you get right down into the meat of how we author our own reality, we do that first from the basis of direct observation. Heather has brought in direct observations that fly in the face of everything that we have been told our entire lives about the court systems and how they work. Heather has brought observations into this courtroom that fly into the face of everything that C. Clifford Shirley Jr. is saying, that Anne Marie Svalto is saying, and that Cynthia Davidson are asserting, either written or in verbal testimony. When you have direct observations that everybody can look at and everybody can say, yeah, well, there was a foreclosure that happened on the United States Corporation and it happened through the exact same systems that, you know, we would go foreclose on any person or any business that's in the United States. Well, that's an observation that you can't ignore. You can't sweep it under the rug. You end up with a huge lump under your carpet. It turns into the elephant in the living room. The kind of conversation that's going on here reminds me of many of the conversations that I had growing up. The kind of techniques that Svalto and C. Clifford Shirley Jr. are using against Heather are some of the most refined gaslighting techniques, some of the most refined picking fight techniques that I have ever seen. And as far as identifying yourself, I'm going to tell you how I used to get ready for a shift as a police officer. After putting on my uniform, my duty belt, my badge, my name tag, all of that, In one of my shirt pockets, the breast pocket on my shirt, I would put two cards in there. They were both from my wallet. One was my driver's license, my own personal driver's license. And the other one was the identification card that I had been issued by the police department that I was working. I had my state-issued ID, I had a department-issued ID, and I was in full uniform And I had to pull that stuff out and show it to people. Not all the time, not every call, but there were times when I had to do that. And I was prepared and willing to do that. And I knew the section of the state law that gave me my authority, gave me my powers. They drilled that into our heads during the academy. There was no mistake about that. And to read through what I've been reading through in these past few pages about Heather Ann Tucci asking a judge and two prosecuting attorneys for the same shit that I used to carry around in my pocket on every shift, there's a fucking problem here, people. And Heather's light is getting out to the world because I'm reflecting that out to the family. And I hope the family reflects that out 
to the rest of your connections, the rest of your friends, the rest of your family, the rest of your coworkers, your peers. This is how we unwind hell. This is how we unwind evil and get back to living. All right, well, how's that for an extra page or two, Terry? We're going to start up on page 86 when we come back. A lot of fireworks here. I certainly appreciate all the wonderful comments and the emails that are coming in. There are plenty of people that send me PDFs that show that they are in... And similar conversations with, with the courts in the United States. And that should bring you all a lot of hope. Because it's not just Heather that's got this message. There is a huge group of people that are following right behind her. And when you get down to the meat of this matter... Heather's brought in direct observations from a place of knowing and has informed the courts. And now we get to watch their behavior going forward because their behavior is going to tell us exactly who they are. Are they the beast? Do they refuse to look at their senses, their eyes, their ears? Do they refuse to do a little sleuthing? Do they refuse to honor the law? that they have been ostensibly telling everybody that they have sworn to uphold and follow? Or are they going to allow their souls to find out who they are, allow themselves to be who they are and follow their heart and use an open mind and a little bit of logic to co-create a new world going forward. I ask that Grace continue to shine her light on all facets and all sides of this issue. We all have a stake, and there's a lot of tension, and there's a lot of disagreement in here. But what I do see is direct observations to for all of us to root our perceptions in a place of knowing going forward. We'll be back for part six and finish this transcript out really soon. I love you guys a lot. Bye-bye.